Thank you, Dean Galvin, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. We are very excited. So we're going to be talking a little bit briefly about some of the work that we do at Notre Dame. And let me start this here. Yes. So I am Nicole Ache. And I'm John Grieco. And we're both at the Department of Biological Sciences, and we also are joint faculty at the Eck Institute for Global Health. We're also medical entomologists, so one of the things that we want to do today is ex to uh, present some of the things that we do as medical entomologists. And one of the first things you may ask yourself is, what is medical entomology? Well, if you look at it, entomology is the study of insects. And if you put medical in front of that, what we study are things like mosquitoes, ticks, other types of bugs that transmit disease. So this discipline allows us to travel all around the world, collect some interesting things, and work with some really nasty bugs. But we also combine laboratory activities with our international field activities to be able to develop and evaluate ways to better prevent arthropods from interacting with humans. What does that mean? We want to stop them from biting you. So we're gonna hear from John in just a little bit, but for now I wanna ask you a question. Do you know what the deadliest animal is on the planet? Oh, you saw my slides before you got here. Right, absolutely, we have mosquitoes. They're not polar bears, it's not sharks, it's not snakes. It's mosquitoes, very, very small creatures. And did you know that mosquitoes cause more death and disease than any other animal on the planet? Absolutely. And all of these diseases that you see listed here are only a few. There's actually more. So we're going to talk just a little bit about a few of those for mosquitoes. Where do these diseases occur? Where do you think all the mosquito-borne diseases occur? <laughs> Typically, they occur in the tropics, right? We need to have warm weather. We need to have rain in order for mosquitoes to develop. So they do occur worldwide, even in temperate areas, meaning even in cooler temperature areas. So mostly in the tropics, but everywhere. In the US and also in Texas. So we should be really excited about learning about mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases because they could affect you and your family and you can participate in ways to control them. How many people have heard of Zika? A lot of people, right? Zika's been really big in the news right now. Well, Zika cases we have reported to the Centers for Disease Control, which is where John and I have a lot of partners at the CDC. We have up to 237 cases of Zika being reported right here in Texas. But these are mostly travel related. And what does that mean? That means that these are cases that happen when people travel outside of Texas and they come back and they don't feel well and they go to the doctor and it's been diagnosed as Zika. So we have Zika in the US, but only in Florida has it been locally transmitted by mosquitoes. Otherwise, it's only people traveling and coming back and being sick. But how many people have heard of dengue fever? Not as many, right? But you've, you have heard of it. Well, dengue fever actually also has occurred here in Texas. And in 2013, there was an outbreak 21 counties, 95 cases, and it was 24% were locally acquired. What that means is that the mosquitoes that transmit this virus, which causes dengue fever, actually cause the transmission to occur right here in Texas. So we want to pay attention to how we can better protect ourselves and control against these diseases. We have two main mosquitoes that cause Zika, dengue fever, something called chikungunya, and many other types of mosquito-borne illnesses. Aedes aegypti, known as the yellow fever mosquito, and Aedes albopictus, known as the Asian tiger mosquito. And they look similar, but there's main differences that even you can look at yourself. And the one Aedes aegypti has an instrument-like shape on its, on its back. And I don't know if you can see this mouse, but it looks like a little lyre-shaped instrument. Whereas Aedes albopictus just has a single stripe, white stripe. And you can even see it with your eyes if you, if you were to look at them uh, with, even without a microscope. These two mosquito species are actually around many states here in the US. So here's the map up above is for Aedes aegypti and down below is Aedes albopictus. And so 
Those of you who are not from Texas, you can look at your state and you can see whether or not you would expect to have these mosquitoes here. And in fact, they're very common. Did you know that we have four main developmental stages in all mosquito life cycle? Half are aquatic, that's the egg, the larvae, and the pupae. And half are terrestrial, meaning the adults, they're free flying. And we can find ways, both John and myself and all of our friends and colleagues that do medical entomology, we find ways to control mosquitoes from biting you and control their population, either from the aquatic stage or from the adult stage. But it's challenging because some of the eggs from Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus can withstand being dry. What that means is that they may be able to hatch three to six months after they've been laid. So you have to be very mindful of trying to control the eggs from being laid to begin with. The larvae for Aedes are known as wigglers. And if you saw them out in the booth, you could see how they move. And they wiggle, just like a, a snake. Pupae, they do not eat at all. They only take two to three days from pupae to become an adult. So it's very fast. They don't need to eat at all. And in the adult stage, only the adult females bite. Males do not bite at all. So we want to really focus our research on controlling female mosquitoes because they're the ones that will bite and transmit these diseases. So where in your backyard are Aedes, these types of mosquitoes? You can spend some time in your own backyard and around your house and you'll find at least some. In fact, yesterday, John and I were just in Austin, Texas, and we collected some of these 80s mosquitoes to be able to bring out here for you. And we want you to participate in looking at your own backyard. You're going to find them in flower pot, pots that have a little bit of water, maybe in your bird bath if you haven't changed your water out, even in your gutters, in tree holes. These are known as container breeders because they only need about a teaspoon of water in order to survive. So, you can go out into your own backyard and look at all these different areas that are natural or man-made containers, and you could find these mosquitoes. Tires, soda cans, and bottles are also great sources of larvae. So how can you participate in prevention and control of mosquito-borne illnesses? You can use insect repellents. You can spray and, and put topical repellents on yourself. Only the EPA registered. We have safety issues to consider. You can wear long sleeves and shirt, uh, long sleeve shirts and pants to protect yourself from mosquitoes from biting you. And you can also, like I mentioned, control mosquitoes in and around your house. So go out and take a look to see if you can find those wigglers and those tumblers, and you can remove them and remove the water. But are there any other tropical diseases, diseases here in the U.S. that are not transmitted by mosquitoes? What do you think? Yes or no? Absolutely. That's why John's standing right here, because he's going to take it over. Thank you. You are exactly right. So yes, there are a lot of diseases transmitted in the United States that are not transmitted by mosquitoes. And I want to talk to you a little bit about one of the, the, the insects that we study at Notre Dame uh, in looking at transmission that occurs in Central and South America. But it also occurs here in Texas, and that's Chagas disease. How many of you have heard of the, the disease called Chagas disease? A few of you, not many. So you can start seeing, you start seeing that, that the mosquito-borne diseases, you hear a lot more about Zika, maybe dengue, but now Chagas is not on a lot of your radars in terms of what's going on in, in Texas. But it is a very complicated life cycle and it is a very interesting disease to study. So the, uh, not to take anything away from the mosquitoes and what you heard just, just uh, now, but this is truly a really beautiful bug, but you may have to be an entomologist to really love this bug. If you look at it, it's bright orange, it's, it's, it's large, it's about an inch to an inch and a half in size. It's really an attractive bug, but maybe that's just me. So if you look at the, the transmission of this disease, it's really not a human disease. It's transmitted in the environment amongst dogs and the bug but also be transmitted by things like possums and, and other rodents in the environment. They can carry the parasite, and when the bug bites them, it picks up the parasite and transmit, transmits it to other bugs. What happens, though, is when you go into certain areas, these bugs can't find possums, they can't find dogs. So what other uh, animals might they look for to bite? 
humans, exactly. So you guys are, are, to the bugs, just another giant sack of blood, which is kind of disconcerting at times. So if you look at where the, uh, the triatomes occur, they, they occur all throughout the southern part of the United States. And you might not hear them called triatomes. You may hear them called a variety of other names, like chinch bugs or hissing bugs. One of the ones that I really like is called the vampire bug because it's a really large bug and it takes a lot of blood. But in Texas, there are th uh, throughout the entire transmission area, there's 130 different types of triatomes that can transmit Chagas. In Texas, there are three out of the 11 that you might find in the United States. So you have a large number here and, and they are transmitting the disease locally, particularly around the San Antonio area, which is, which is something that you really need to be aware of. But did you know that there are five nymphal stages of this bug? This bug is a very long-lived bug. It can live for more than a year. Unlike mosquitoes that may live for maybe a week, two weeks uh, for its lifespan, this bug can live for, for more than a year. Each life stage can take a month to two months to develop. And each life stage takes blood. And unlike mosquitoes, where it's only the females that take blood, this bug, both the males and the females, take blood. So it's requiring a lot of blood throughout its entire lifespan. The other thing to, to realize is that if you watch this bug here, this is really kind of disturbing, the amount of blood this bug takes. So if you look at that, how much blood do you think that bug is taking? <laughs> I, so I, I did a quick calculation before I arrived. And each bug, a, an adult bug, can take about a teaspoon of blood. Now if you look at, at the lifespan of that bug, and each, each male and female at each stage taking a teaspoon of blood, that adds up to a lot of blood. This is a really nasty little creature. So the nymphs bite, but only the adults fly. And that's very important because the nymphs will live kind of in the forested areas around other animal homes, around nests, but the adults will fly to lights. So if you have a street light, they'll be attracted to that. They'll be attracted to CO2. One of the most disturbing things I've ever seen was we went into a cave one time where these bugs were living and you don't see them anywhere. And you're walking around and you start respiring CO2 as you breathe and the bugs just start coming in out of the walls. We had maybe 40 or 50 of these things just crawling around, and it is really kind of uh, uh, disturbing to see that level of infestation in some of these locations. So why, one of the names is a kissing bug. Why do you think it's called a kissing bug? <laughs> I hear a lot of different answers out there. This bug likes to come in at night. So it feeds primarily at night. And what it does is when you're up underneath your covers and you have everything on, the bug will generally bite you around the face. And so they call it a kissing bug because many times it'll bite you around the mouth. The other thing you need to know is it's not the bite that transmits disease. It's the poop of the bug. So yeah, it's pretty disgusting, isn't it? So when the bug feeds, it poops. And you'll rub that into your eye, you'll rub it into your nose, or you'll rub it into the bite, and that's how you get infected. So it's a little bit different than some of the things we're talking about with the mosquitoes. That's a pretty disgusting little creature. So in terms of Texas, the infection you can see around the San Antonio area, a little bit further south, that's where we find most of the infected bugs. In terms of the human cases, it's very difficult to identify uh, the disease itself. So most people who have it don't go out and seek, uh, you know, whether they're, they're, whether they're infected or not. So what we do is we look for it in the blood bank donations. We look for it in, in stored blood. And that's where we get most of the positive uh, case or positive detections of this, of this parasite. So again, you can see around the San Antonio area, is, is a very common area for this, for this um, transmission to be occurring. So how can you prevent and control this disease? Remove wood, brush, and other things like rock piles. These bugs like getting into really tight crevices. In South America, they'll get into the cracks of plaster and things in homes. 
but around your house, they're gonna be in wood piles and in rock piles, things that where they, they typically find rodents and other things that they'll be feeding off of. You can also seal up holes and cracks in your house. If there's any place for these bugs to get in, they're gonna get in. They're, whenever they're not blood fed, they're, they're really thin and they can squeeze through holes in, in netting and other places and kind of really get into the house. So you wanna make sure that all the, the ways that they can get in from the outside are, are sealed up. Also, have your pets sleep indoors or treat areas around your pet structures. Because again, if you remember that slide I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of the transmission occurs in the animal cycle. And dogs, they love to feed on dogs. So if your dog is sleeping outside around a rock pile, that bug's gonna come out, feed on them. And if the dog's not around, they can come and feed on you. So make sure your, your pets are protected as well. But there's a lot of other resources on this disease as well as many other diseases transmitted by insects. So I encourage you to go out and search online and go to things like the CDC, the World Health Organization, the state health departments. They have a lot more information, a lot of things that you can look at for determining what types of bugs are living in your area and what things you can do to protect yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, does anybody have any questions? We have a little bit of time for questions. You have to raise your hand or stand up so we can see you. I see one way in the back in a red shirt. Yes, yeah, stand up please. Baseball hat, yeah, there you go. What's the biggest mosquito? You know, that's a great question. I would have to say that if all the food and the water and everything is constant for all mosquitoes. We have Toxorhynchites. That's a strange name, isn't it? Toxorhynchites. It's a genus of mosquito. Very big. They can be upwards of about an inch to maybe an inch and a half big. But you know what's interesting about Toxorhynchites? They do not bite people. They have no functioning mouth parts. So they only feed on sugar and they don't bite and they're actually predaceous. So sometimes medical entomology, we look to see if we can use them in containers to eat other larvae. They eat other mosquito larvae, but I would say Toxorhynchites. And then if you look at blood feeding mosquitoes, the one in Texas that's the largest is probably Serophora ciliata. It's a species that you find around the Gulf Coast of Texas, and we often lovingly call it the galley nipper because it's, it takes so much blood. It's slightly smaller than the Toxorhynchites, but at the same time, the larvae of that species also feeds on other mosquito larvae, but it does take blood. Okay, one question. Oh, I see somebody standing up right here. Yes. How did we learn all about this stuff? We actually learned it from early on, and I think both John and I have different paths, but. You know, we learned it in our class, in our classes when we were actually starting in college. And we also were exploring our environment at an early age. And then as we got to Notre Dame, of course, and in our careers, we became more and more interested in helping others. So that, that's the way that we learn all this stuff. And, and I'll share my experience just a little bit because I'm a native Texan as well. I grew up in, in Austin, Texas, and I, Loved science. I loved getting out in the field, really exploring, getting dirty, collecting bugs at an early age. And because all of these things are really fun. I mean, it, science can be exciting. You learn something new every day. And when I went to Notre Dame, I, I studied under a, a really good medical entomologist named George Craig. And he was the one that got me excited about going into the field. It takes me all over the world and I'm able to do a lot of the things that I've, I've always wanted to do in science and explore a lot of these issues. So it's a fun area. Okay, only two more. I see, let's do a young woman. And actually you were standing up I think before. Yes, go ahead. Have to speak up.
studying what we do, have we ever traveled to other places like South America, Brazil? Absolutely. In fact, we just came back from Thailand last Thursday, I think it was, and we were in Indonesia before that, and we're going to Brazil in two weeks. So many of the diseases that we research are going to be outside of the U.S., and for John and I, our research focuses on an international medical entomology. So we go to those locations where the diseases have highest burden. Okay, we just have time for one more. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's see. John, you pick. <laughs> Here in the front. Okay, yes. What are the symptoms of diseases that when the bug bites you on the mouth, the Chagas disease? That's, a, that's a great question. So initially, there's something that's called Romagna sign, okay? And that's a swelling of the eye or area where you rub the parasite into. So you can get a really swelled up eye uh, if you rub it into your eye, and it's called Romagna sign. Other than that, it'll resolve itself, and then over a period of time, it, it attacks cardiac muscle. And so what happens is you may start feeling tired because your heart isn't pumping as well. But this may be 10, 15 years after you get infected. So it's a, it's a really bad disease because many times you don't even know you're infected until maybe 10, 15 years after you get the actual first introduction of the parasite. And that is why, as medical entomologists, our goal is to prevent them from biting you in the first place. Because we do not want people to become sick. We're trying to prevent the bugs from biting you. I think that's all the time we have. But again, check out these resources, okay? All right, bye-bye.